Hello and welcome to the Royal Road School of Carmelite Prayer. Today I would like to present an article entitled Treasures of the Carmelite Spirituality. It was an interview done by a journalist from Croix, a French magazine. His name is Jill Domeda, and he's talking to Father John Alexander of the Lamb, a Carmelite friar in France. Introduction My life of prayer helped me to clarify my desires and to go to a deeper level in a desire for God, for life, and for a more radical commitment, and that is enormously inspiring. Father John Alexander of the Lamb, OCD, is a member of the Discalced Carmelites, founded in the 16th century by St. Teresa of Avila and St. John of the Cross. He is currently assigned to the Carmelite Spiritual Center in Avon, near Fontainebleau, in Seine and Marne, France. This dynamic and young Carmelite friar is today the master of novices and postulants. He accompanies the young candidate spiritually towards the religious life. Part one, an essential need. I began to practice silent prayer towards the end of my university studies. When I began working as a young professional, I came to realize after a few months of practice that silent prayer was not just a pastime for me, but had actually become an essential need in my life. I like to use the image of silent prayer as being the cornerstone of my life. It wasn't the moments filled with great joy during prayer that struck me, but rather when I would go through the difficult moments with Christ to live those moments with him in faith. It was this experience that allowed me to speak to people about a spiritual life of prayer in a way that was now backed up by my own experience. St. Teresa of Avila herself used this word, experience. She used it in the 16th century, and this is amazing. A woman who speaks, who writes in the first person in the 16th century. At the time, this was quite daring. She speaks of her experience. She speaks with authority in a time that was almost the Middle Ages. This type of discourse was reversed, reserved for the wise, the doctors, the theologians, and the philosophers. But Teresa insisted on her own experience, on what she had learned from others' experience, and was willing to hold it up for theological review. Today, people are attentive to giving credit to things rather than to what people say. You know, empty talk. Part two, a relationship. The practice of silent prayer comes from the Spanish word oraison. Silent prayer is a way of prayer that is personal, distinguishing it from liturgical prayer. It is lived out in a climate of silence. It is something that is intimate and personal with the Lord. There is something about its daily practice, not about something exceptional. It's a prayer that nourishes our daily lives. We can speak of silent prayer referring to St. Teresa of Avila. She describes this prayer in simple terms, a relationship something personal. She speaks of it as a friendship where there is an intimate exchange with Christ, and so it evolves because it's a relationship. There is a story. I like to think of silent prayer as the story of a friendship with someone special that is not visible with our eyely, our bodily eyes, except if you have visions, which I don't but is someone that we look for throughout our entire lives. Though God doesn't change, I do. And so the story evolves with the seasons of life that can be variable, fill us with joy, or surprises, 
or throw us into an absence or a sadness. It's not about how I feel, which can be important. And these elements are interesting concerning silent prayer, but they are not defining elements. We can turn to mindfulness meditation. That can have value, its own importance, but it's not in the same league with silent prayer that has a primary relationship as a dimension. Part three, a mission. The practice of prayer implies not only something concrete, but it also implies work. Today, with the notion of personal development, we are looking for a form of spiritual life that flows, allows for development, and a continuity of pleasure. It's not bad in itself, but there are, in a life of prayer, disagreeable moments, boring moments, and or feelings of lassitude. In Carmel, prayer is a place of joy, but it's also a place of effort, of work, and of mission. I think in our religious life, there is fundamentally a mission to practice two hours of prayer daily, one in the morning and one at night, as do our Carmelite sisters. We mostly experience these hours together in community in the chapel. Interested souls from the community may of course come and pray with us. It's a way of practicing. It isn't because I'm tired today that I'm gonna stay in bed. That wouldn't be right because my presence is expected. It's my mission in the church to pray, not only because it does me good, but because God is calling me to fill this place in his church. My place is to intercede. I bring to prayer, which also escapes me, this or that situation of hope, difficulties, sufferings, and or joy. There is an aspect of practicing prayer that implies a dimension of being. I don't know what God is doing or what's happening but I have something to do. I have to engage myself almost physically, bodily in this work. I really like that expression, practicing prayer, because it implies not only that the head is engaged, but that there's an intellectual and a physical aspect as well. Part four, development of a prayer life. What seems important to me above all else are the essential elements of prayer, initially the external elements, the time given to prayer. But what is also really important is the constancy, choosing a time frame that seems the most realistic, one that I can stick with. It's easy after a week of a retreat when all seems euphoric to make an unrealistic commitment but it is important to consider what is workable realistically in my life. Even if I miss a day now and then, we can start out realistically with 10 or 15 minutes a day, gradually increasing that time to 20 minutes, but not more in the beginning. One of the suggestions that St. Teresa gives when beginning a life of prayer is that of determination. In other words, Strive to maintain these 10 minutes every day and not go off the rails by trying to impose a half an hour on yourself that after a few months will fall by the wayside because it's just too hard to maintain. The essential element in a life of prayer is not what I am doing, but rather what the Holy Spirit is doing in me. And this goes beyond my comprehension. To believe that even if my prayer life is lacking or beyond limit, I do have freedom in spite of everything. The important thing is to have trust in what the Holy Spirit is doing in me. Part five, a daily routine. I seek silence 
and an interior stability for prayer, perhaps in my room or a church or in nature, where I can have quality in my presence to both myself and to God, which is important. In the beginning, it's important to establish a personal ritual in prayer. I can start by making a very slow sign of the cross, aware of what I'm doing. Next, I can light a candle, followed by what St. Teresa calls, in her own language, consideration. In other words, by consideration, she means it's important to have an awareness of being present to myself and to the other. Presence to yourself means it is important to know yourself, to know who you are, not just intellectually, but corporally as well. That may be one of the advantages of mindful meditation. I pray with the whole man, first of all my physical presence, not just stopping at the intellect. To be present for what I am preparing to experience, what's important for me is to take a break. Take a break to center myself. Before reuniting with the Lord, I need a break from everything or everything will be taking place in the control tower. But it will only be thoughts about God. That's not bad, but it isn't quite prayer. Prayer takes place, first of all, at the level of a relationship. Next, the posture. The posture is very important. We need to pay attention to it. Ask yourself what will help you pray being seated, standing, kneeling, half kneeling, half standing. It isn't the same for everyone. It isn't the same for all people. It is especially important to pay attention to the position of your back, to be able to breathe in and breathe out freely. Strive to have a long and slow respiration, long and slow respiration breathing in and breathing out. In the Orthodox tradition, there is the prayer of the heart, the Jesus prayer. We don't necessarily have to go looking for prayers in the Orient. No, we can use the simple prayer, the Jesus prayer. We can engage in a simple biblical prayer said in time with our breath, such as Lord Jesus, living Son of God, said on the inspiration have pity on me, a sinner, said on the expiration. And this is an example taken from the Russian pilgrim. The first work on ourselves is the break, like we just talked about. It's important to consider at the beginning of the prayer to consider who I am bringing into the meeting. The second element is the presence to oneself and the presence to God. As Teresa stresses the importance of considering to whom I am speaking, to continually remind myself in a way continually surprised and knew that God is interested in me and wants to spend time with me. Measure the distance that can exist between God and me. In a sense, there is a text that really touched St. Teresa. That is the text talking about the Samaritan woman. The woman was surprised that a Jew would come towards her to speak with her. When I run a school of prayer where we train participants in the practice of silent prayer, we could each day start uh, the time of prayer with this prayer of surprise. What? You, Lord? You have so many things to run in the church, in the world, elsewhere, and you find time to spend a moment with with me. This is an act of faith. We can begin our prayer time with this prayer.
this we can do. Measure the freshness of the surprise at the creator who is interested in his creation. God is interested in me? We can put ourselves in a position to receive a word to show that this relationship is important to us. Part six, what to say to the Lord. The third thing that Teresa says, what am I to say to the Lord? Or the body of the exchange between God and the prayee. This is the heart of prayer. Based on the time available, it can be more or less long. Among the ingredients that can nourish the relationship are biblical text or other spiritual text. I could receive a word from the tradition or from the Lord that tells me who he is and which helps me understand who I am talking to. I can imagine who God is, but bottom line, it is up to me to know him as he was revealed to me unrelated to my imagination. I can listen for a word, receive perhaps, awaken a desire, something new that will touch something in me that is happy or something that's maybe painful. The dialogue works by listening to the word received. It isn't formed in me and I will be able to say something in return. The text touches me to be able to maintain this relationship, to come back to a verse that touched me. I'll just repeat it or meditate on it, such as, wow, I never thought of that story of Jesus multiplying the bread, the fish. There are going to be times, seasons in prayer, where I will be more stuck by reflexive prayer, that is, the use of my intelligence, my intellect. Other times will be more emotional, where I am touched by my daily life. That is the situation where I take an external text, or I can nourish my prayer life with what I live on a daily basis, whether it be big or small. It can spring up, and I allow it in prayer in its rightful place. I can say that I experienced this or that thing, and that triggers another experience, which allows me to reread and step back and bring it to the Lord to see how it will be clarified. I like to end this prayer time by a regular prayer, such as the Angelus or the Hail Mary or the Glory Be, and determine the internal attitude at the end of prayer, as it is and not how I thought it was. This is the way to detach from the emotional feelings. If I realize that during the 50 minutes of prayer, I was mainly distracted, which is a fact, so I admit it, but I offer it to God. Yup, Lord, I was distracted. But I offer you my distractions. I offer them to you. You figure it out, Lord. You know my goodwill, and hopefully I'll do better next time, tomorrow. Without that, I risk staying at a psychological level where I am telling myself that I'm worthless, like yesterday. I'm no longer in relationship. Offer the prayer as it was lived and remember that it isn't my work. I think one of the biggest traps today in our society is performance, especially spiritual performance. This time it was three out of five, or maybe it was a five out of five. But really, what do I know? After all, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. Part seven, the fruits. The fruits of prayer. Personally, the most significant fruit of prayer is that of being made whole, becoming whole. The unifying aspect of prayer between the inside and the outside. 
being made into a coherent self, all comes together in one direction. As a religious person, we live this out in a strong or very intense way. A life of prayer is basically about desire. St. Teresa talks a lot about silent prayer. She says, To those who have not yet begun to practice prayer, Lord, I beg you that they would not deprive themselves of such a great good. It's not about fearing, but about desiring. The desire is the motive, what I want, what lives inside of me that's lacking. This desire will be something fundamental. A life of prayer implies a confrontation between our desires and the choices we impose on ourselves. I can't do everything. I can't do it all. There are 24 hours in a day, so I need to look at my day. I need to prioritize and let go of superficial desires that come maybe from my family, maybe from the, my surroundings, the culture that I live in. I want to do that because others are doing it. That's the wrong reason. While other desires that characterize me will be able to then emerge as the unimportant desires are put aside, leaving place for something much more profound. My life of prayer has helped me to clarify my desires and to descend to a deeper level in a desire for God, in a desire for life, for commitments, more extreme, radical, harder to describe, but that motivate enormously. I spend a lot of time in things that distracted me and didn't nourish my profound self, my profound I. The fact of descending down to my deepest level creates that interior center where I can draw deeper within myself. This brings about a certain stability in life that will permit me to meet life, life's constraints. What do I have within to be able to meet life's distractions? We are living in a time when people are feeling more fragile, fragile, more fragile than before, as we lack today the former exterior structures and so we need an interior life that is much stronger. I believe that a life of prayer creates men and women who are well structured within by a desire for God, by something within that through Christ's grace are able to meet life's challenges. Amen. So once again, I'd just like to repeat that this was an interview given to a journalist named Jill Domada from the magazine, the French magazine, Quoi, which means to believe. And he spoke with Father John Alexander of the Lamb. He's a Carmelite friar, and he is located uh, in the spiritual center in Avon, which is uh, east of Paris. So I hope you enjoy it. I, I always enjoy hearing Carmelite friars talk about um, what constitutes really the essential of the Carmelite life. So God bless you all, and uh, thank you for listening, and just be very, very blessed. Amen.